from the Hard Rock Hotel in Las Vegas, it's The Cube, covering HoshoCon 2018, brought to you by Hosho. Hello everyone, welcome to the special Cube coverage. We are here live in Las Vegas for HoshoCon. I'm John Furrier, the host of the Cube, and this is part of our continuing coverage and our uh, initiating coverage of the blockchain crypto world. Been doing it since January, covering on our on our journal site SiliconAngle.com since 2011, covering Bitcoin and all blockchain stuff. But this is the first security conference dedicated around blockchain and crypto, put on by Hosho, and it's called HoshoCon. It's an industry conference, and we are here covering it. And this is an open, small kernel of smart people really trying to have a top-level conversation around security. And our next guest is Christopher Ford, who's the CTO of 3BX. Welcome to theCUBE, thanks oh, for thank joining you. us. Yeah, a pleasure being here. So, um, before we get into some questions around security, what do you guys do? What's the company do? You guys have a unique approach. Take a minute to explain what you guys do. 3BX is, is essentially, it's a marketplace. It's a digital asset marketplace. Uh, we're trying to build a community around trading digital assets. Um, we're really trying to focus on pulling away from the term cryptocurrency because we think it'll expand into a much broader term. So we're, we're, uh, we're structuring our, our platform on the support of you know, any type of digital asset, whether it be a crypto kitty or whether it be a, um, an e-book, a concert ticket, you know, something that has a digital form that can be traded you know, person to person. So basically you're expanding the definition, or actually depositioning crypto because it's kind of narrow relative to how yeah, you guys see it's it. It's pretty narrow. Digital assets, I mean look yep. at gaming, any Absolutely. gaming culture is, I mean, yep. this is not new. Yep. I mean they trade stuff all over yeah, the place. Yeah sure, <laughs> even like in-game tokens, you know, they don't, they don't exist on a blockchain yet, they're not you know, yeah. cryptographically uh, secured, so you know, those are the, the types of things that I expect to see hitting a lot of these marketplaces yeah. soon. Well that's smart, I mean I think if you look at it, and a lot of, I mean certainly we have run blockchain, our entire media company has been moving to blockchain and crypto and token economics, but really the blockchain piece has been very limited, it's like yeah. it's got very poor functionality, yeah. and all the top blockchain implementations are either private blockchain, low latency, um, and fast and developer friendly. So you know, sure. Ethereum's great for smart contracts, but it just doesn't scale relative to yeah. what, what most people need. If you're sure. running, you need a million IOPS, yeah. you know, and you've got a marketplace. Yeah. Some of these large scale, hyperscale um, networks, they're massive marketplaces. Yeah, it's huge. How do you guys fit in there? Do you guys, you guys, what, what, do you, what problem are you trying to solve? Let me start with that. You know, we're trying to pull away from the complexities of an exchange. We're, we're trying to give kind of the community a good tool to trade without a lot of knowledge of tokenomics. Um, one of our unique assets, or unique uh, um, features is that you can trade with no market impact. You don't have to worry about you know, price slippage or the, the complexities behind uh, order books. So we, we give a kind of a familiar interface to trading, so something you see on a, a traditional e-commerce platform. So we're trying to kind of introduce it to a, a wider range of people. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked to a lot of people who have a lot of difficulties, especially with the decentralized exchanges. Yeah. Um, what are their problems? Just like reliability? Reliability, black box. Li liquidity. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of issues with liquidity around them, which, which causes problems when you try to trade any significant amount of coin. So we're trying to give uh, traders and the coin companies another outlet to trade without having to worry about you know, uh, liquidity or the risks of liquidity associated with. So what's the status of the company? How many people you guys got? What's, what's the size? Do you have any deployments? Are you guys engaging certain communities now? We are now? live. Uh, we released a kind of a invite only beta about two months ago. So we've been uh, out there having traders um, for about two months. Uh, we're a very small team. We're based out of Las Vegas. There's you know, a development team of three people. Um, we're just now kind of broadening into more partnerships, more marketing. So you guys uh, have been really hardening cool. the platform, basically, yeah. been jamming and coding yeah, away. Yeah, we went, we went kind of uh, product first and then took a step back and are now approaching the market. Um, so yeah, we're really excited. That's smart, you didn't hype it up first. Yeah, we didn't hype but it up. But you could have definitely hyped it up. I mean, a lot of people who are winning right now yeah. are quality deals that had opportunities to do an ICO. Yeah. <laughs> just people are throwing money around. Yeah. Just go back to February, the numbers are just off the charts. Yeah, it's it kind of bubbled, burst in February. Um, and certainly the SEC announced today, I'm covering the news, um, major crackdown on all those ICOs, on violations here yep. in the United States. It just causes a distraction, and I brought this up with Hartej last time I interviewed him in Toronto at The Futurist, which is exactly kind of what you guys are doing, and this is a core trend, and I want to get your thoughts on it. A lot of the alpha entrepreneurs, the ones that are building companies, 
don't want to get distracted from stuff that's not optimized on building a company. For instance, if I do an ICO or you get involved in domicile issues outside the United States, you're optimizing all of your energy either on an yeah. airplane or market sure. dynamics that aren't building a company. Yeah. This is kind of almost a, a, a distinction at this point. You can almost look at opportunities, startups, entrepreneurs, and ventures and say, okay, we can almost see who's doing what. Yeah. Do sure. you agree? Yeah, I, I think it's important to have something before you go and you, you spend a lot of energy raising money, building a pipe around a company. I mean, I think we're going to see a huge trend towards you know, product first, having something, having a development team, a concept, a patent, mm -hmm. you know, whether it be uh, uh, not just based on you know, a theoretical white paper. Yeah. yeah. So it, it'll be very interesting to see how it, how it goes. We decided to go product first, so you know, no one had heard of us until we went live with our yeah. product. Uh, oh, good approach, I like it, I think yeah. it's solid. Good, good, we'll see how it turns out. Yeah. But I got to ask you, and, and I want to dig into the product a little, a little later but on this interview, but I want to ask you specifically around some core trends I'm seeing and patterns. Sure. It's pretty clear that when these emerging markets develop, total activity on the entrepreneurial side, a lot of people building, developing, yep. attacking the market, but this a trend, everyone's, everyone's throwing out a common thing. I need to have community, and I need a two-sided marketplace. So the, the, the common threads, and if people don't have those, you can't just buy a community. Like, yeah. Communities aren't bought. You, sure. don't, you can't like, just say, hey, I need a community. Yeah. Put a Telegram channel, write some bots, and next yeah. thing you know, I got 25,000 people on Telegram. Yeah. That's not a community. That's not a community. That is AI bots yeah. looking like a community. Sure. And then the two-sided marketplace, you got to have a value proposition. So these are things that people are putting into their plans yep. that don't have answers for. Sure. What's your thoughts on that uh, around community and about marketplace? What are you seeing in the mar in market developing right now? Um, I mean, building a strong community is very difficult. I mean, they have to align with your product, they have to align with your vision. Um, they have to understand what you're doing and at least have, have a use case for it. So we're really trying to, to kind of have the community drive our development roadmap. So um, we've done a lot of outreach trying to get, you know, what people are interested in, what, what's lacking in the, the industry currently, what they want to see, what they're unhappy with. Um, and we're trying to build a community around, you know, allowing people to have input and, and influence into, into the product that we're building. So we find it, you know, we're, we're really early in the, the process, so it's, it's difficult for me to really say that it's, you know, easy or difficult to So you're to build engaging a community. the community. We are help. engaging the community. What are the number one things you guys are solving, and problems that you see that are immediate low-hanging fruit that not, you're knocking out right away? What are the core things? Um, I think some of the big ones are simplicity, uh, the usability of these interfaces. Um, kind of the knowledge around it, uh, trying to do a knowledge transfer to our customer base, um, and trying to help people realize that there's a company behind these coins. I think that's a, a huge a huge thing that we have to kind of push towards is, you know, it's not just a token, it's a token produced by a, a company with a, with a cause. So, so how does your product work? It's, it's like a basic marketplace that you would see in kind of uh, eBay or an Amazon where someone posts an offer, mm -hmm. uh, posts a, a listing, and other people can buy from it. So it's a buy and sell kind of. And you have your own native token? We have a native uh, ERC20 token that we use for fees. Mm -hmm. Because we're, we're targeting the digital asset you know, generally, um, we've externalized fees from traded goods. So you know, we, uh, we want to make sure that we can handle something that may not be divisible by you know, uh, Bitcoin is. So if you if you trade um, if you trade a book, for example, a lot of these exchanges would take a page out of it if you if you use the current model of, of fees, mm -hmm. where they're they're kind of coin um, coin shaving off of your trades. So we're trying to eliminate that so we can expand into to you know non fungible or non breakable assets. We're also developing a, a wallet that basically encapsulates cryptocurrency into smaller assets to be traded off chain. So we plan on, on kind of revolving around our, uh, our internal token to handle fees of you know, yeah. those assets. So, so it's a blend of on, off chain yep. dynamics. So you can do a lot of stuff and yep. not have to do a lot of writing to the chain if you're going to be new yeah. and a lot of read, read writes. Yep. All right, so the question I want to ask you that I think is important in everyone's mind is, okay, Hosho Khan is the first inaugural. We love going to inaugural events because you yep. don't know, it could be the last one sure. or it's going to be big. Uh, I think this is a big trend and, and one of the things we heard last night at dinner was, and we were having a conversation with, was there's no real conference. These conferences don't put security in the front. Yep. They really kind of have it as a side panel and it's always kind of an adjunct to something, you know, bigger yep. pitch competition, you know, big sponsor driven kind of programs. 
This is a security conference. Yeah. What is the impact, in your opinion, of this Hosho Con and security in the blockchain for, that's going to shape the industry? What is your opinion? What is your commentary on that? I mean, obviously it's important to focus on security. I think a lot of people had a lot of uh, kind of assumptions that blockchain specific or blockchain based technologies were unhackable. You know, the decentralization of, of, of something makes it secure. And I think that's a myth that, you know, they're going to have to debug and we're seeing it with hacks. I mean, there's a, um, there's a, there's a lot of, I think, assumptions around even the hacks that are incorrect. So, you know, bringing the, the idea to people that, you know, blockchain still needs to be managed, you still need to be careful. Um, the smart contracts still have, you know, vulnerabilities and risks involved. It's not... Software is software. Software is software. Yeah. You know, it's... <laughs> it's unavoidable when you start <laughs> writing code. If there's going to be, you don't want the blue screen bugs. of death. Certainly, you know when you don't want to have to reboot. Yeah. I mean, move fast and break stuff was great for web scale, but when you talk about security and currency, yeah. you need rock solid, yeah. hundred percent reliability. Yeah. Otherwise, so, you lose your cash. Yeah, it's your, it, or your e money. Yeah, you, it's something of value that you're going to yeah. lose. It's yeah. not a, a social media account. It's not you yeah. know something like that. It's you know you're losing money, um, and it's it's very interesting. I think. Um, the more people know about the security behind blockchain cryptocurrency, the more they're going to realize that it's not a you know an end-all solution to everything. It's going to you know it takes time to evolve. Um, standards will probably have to be put in place. You know, I mean a lot. There's a lot of people. I remember when I was you know your age and the web was coming around. Everyone was afraid to put their credit card down on basic e-commerce transactions. Sure. And that was natural because like, oh my God, it's online. So yeah. It almost felt like a black box. And then they got over that pretty quickly. You saw PayPal and those kinds of companies came out. And you still mentioned eBay. These online sites are now secure. Crypto, there's almost like an unknown, lack of education in the mainstream. And so we got to get to that point where, you know, wallets are wallets and they well, actually yeah. do a good job and you don't forget to leave your wallet at the yeah. restaurant kind of thing. Sure. You know, like there's some hygiene yeah. <laughs> and practices that are needed. I mean. Yeah. I mean, maybe older generations maybe might not get it, but the younger generations, they're, they're getting it, right? I mean, you're, yeah. what, you, what's your opinion of this? Because this is a generational shift. I mean, this yeah. crypto blockchain market, it's really generational. Anyone sure. under the age of 30 pretty much loves it. Yeah. So it's happening, right? Yeah. So what is, that, what is the, the views around security generally in the mainstream? I mean, I don't think there are too many. I, like I said, I think people kind of put a lot of assumptions in uh, the security, the inherent security of blockchain stuff. And I think they don't realize that, um, you know, we're trying to make it easier through mnemonic sequences or, mm -hmm. or passwords. So we're, we're hosting, hosting wallets online now. It's not necessarily a pure wallet in the sense yeah. that it sits on a piece of paper. So we're, we're going towards usability, which we're sacrificing security for. So the, the more usability we get with a lot of these kind of mainstream products, the more we're going to have to realize that we're getting back to a, a place of, you know, existing security vulnerabilities with yeah. passwords or, you know, um, stuff you would see with your bank account. So it's, it'll be interesting to see the, the balance between, you know, the raw security kind of inherent with like Bitcoin or, you know, a, yeah. a traditional cryptographic wallet and then uh, usability, whether it be cloud-based stuff or these exchanges. You know, Chris, one of the things that you're doing I think is interesting, and it kind of points to the, if you connect the dots, the trend of granular level, low, really levels of granularity getting down to the micro yeah. level. It's microeconomics. Sure. It's a beautiful thing about this market is that you can take a page out of a book, you can track it, and I use that page, I can pay for all kinds of digital rights yeah. stuff, digital, digital assets, if you yeah. look at just the world as a digital asset. This brings up the question of, okay, this is now, there's going to be software that's need to be written to manage this level yeah. of micro transactions sure. or micro assets. So how do you view, in your opinion, this whole notion of token economics? Because um, we've used tokens for years on all the stuff we program, authentication, yep. you know, all tokens are used in computer science, not a new concept. Yep. But if you think about tokens as a currency and as a mechanism for sure. computer science software, yep. Do you see a multi-token multi world? I mean, I'm in, you know, why wouldn't everyone have their own token? And then there's going to have to be sure. software to manage the tokens. Yeah. <laughs> if you have a token and I have a token called the Cube Coin, and yeah. you have your token, there's probably going to have to be some interaction between coins. Do yeah. you see that day happening sooner than later, or do you even see it happening? Uh, you know, it's going to really depend on, on the, the use cases that they find, whether it, a, a single platform is going to come out and kind of take over the standardization of, of managing it, or, you know, who knows? I mean, you see some of these uh, transactional bridges like between Dogecoin or uh, Ethereum. So you can see that happening between tokens or you know, everything being built on the same chain 
or you know having these bridges between chains, whether it be like an EOS to um, Ethereum, you know, token chain bridge. I don't, I don't know who. I mean, we it's really have no idea. Multi chain is interesting, right? I mean, yeah. This is an interesting conversation. My vision is I think multi-chain is a good trend. Why wouldn't you yeah. want to have multiple chains if the use cases are not overlapping? I mean, yeah. I, just don't, I just don't feel comfortable with a monolithic approach of tokens. I just yeah. kind of uncomfortable generally I mean, with I that I think philosophy. it'll be important, and like you said, it'll be very important to have a good solution to manage them. I mean, people yeah. aren't going to want 100 programs on their computer to manage their tokens. They're not going to want uh, you know, multiple apps on their phone. They're, they're, there's going to have to be some standardization so that people can manage it easily. Otherwise, yeah. it, it's going to be impossible to, to keep up with. Um, and the kind of the interchangeability between tokens will be important. Chris, final question for you. What's this event like here? Describe, describe for the folks who aren't here, what's the vibe, who are the people, what are some of the conversations in the hallway so far? Um, what kind of person is here? Sure. What is this event about? What's, what's the relevance of HoshoCon? Well, it seems like it's a lot of, you know, technically minded people kind of hoping to push forward the security in the blockchain world. Um, we've had conversations about uh, everything from educating the, the masses, so you know, kind of the average person who doesn't maybe understand the complexities of Bitcoin, you know, how do you inform them of what we're doing, um, all the way up to you know, what's the next step in security auditing. I mean, that's, you know, Hosho is really pushing forward how do you audit your code on blockchain or on um, a lot of these platforms, and I think it's really important to have these conversations because it's opening up new worlds of, um, you know, new thought habits for each of these companies. I mean, everyone has their has their expertise. You know, Hosho specializes in smart contract auditing, and you know, we may not have the, you know, that in depth of knowledge of how to audit a contract. So, you know, it's nice to kind of share the knowledge and and see that there's other solutions out there than everyone doing it on their own. What do you hope to be known for for your company? If you could have that that vision down the road, three years from now, we look back. What, what do you what do you want to be known for? I mean, I think it would be it would be a best if we were kind of known as a platform to bring newcomers into the space, you know, informing, caring about the community, making sure that uh, they understand what they're doing before they do it. You know, as you know, Bitcoin is, it's very unforgiving. A lot of these cryptos are very unforgiving. So it's, I think it's very important for us to kind of get, to be known as someone who helps bridge that, that kind of uh, intimidation. All right, Chris Ford, for three, 3BX, CTO, uh, entrepreneur, building a company, doing it the right way, uh, plans to use tokens, and you guys, did you raise any money? Did uh, you? Not yet? No raised money, yep. we're privately funded. Nice. So, we're going that route. Good, bootstrapping, yep. making it, bootstrapping. getting it done. Taking a different approach, which is, which is uh, the classic approach of building a company the right way. It's the Cube. we are here in Las Vegas for HoshoCon, I'm John Furrier. Stay with us for more coverage after this short break.